scripture jumped out of the Bible at me. And I said, uh, are you here, Lord? And all of a sudden, it started raining where there was no rain forecast. <laughs> and I was just reading, his rain confirms his presence. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? You take that to the bank. <laughs> if, he's, if it's raining, he's here. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I've got a million and one messages flowing through me. I've got to pick the right one, the one he wants. So just give us a few seconds. Thank you, Lord. I've been talking to the boys in Singapore and Malaysia and God's been speaking some certain things. We've got a, a fellowship once a month on uh, Zoom and we get together with ministers from about eight or nine different countries and we minister to each other on Zoom. And um, my, my good friend Williams Anthony, he's a prophet out of Malaysia, he was sharing this week and he started crying and he said, God's calling his people to repentance. Pasts, beginning with pastors. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? You all thought I was squeaky clean. It's amazing. Isn't it? <laughs> but he was calling us all to, to repentance and, and I'm aware that we're about to see an outpouring of God with these times we're in, they're so uncertain for the worldly people. But you know, we shouldn't be worried at all. Do you know that? We shouldn't have one worry. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. Amen. Yeah, cast your cares upon him. Look to him. Look to the one who can save you. So many people, I've, I get phone calls all the time, different people around the place, pastors, particularly at the moment, a calling, wondering what we're making head or tails out of certain things. And um, I don't want to politicise what's happening out there. I don't want to use the church to politicise anything. But go by your conscience. If you don't believe in your heart, don't do it. <laughs> Whatever it is. Amen? You, this, this flu jab thing that they're talking about, they're pushing it like crazy. I don't care whether you have it or not, really. <laughs> Half the church is kicking up that they shouldn't have it and half the church is kicking up that they should. <laughs> families are being split by this question. We shouldn't allow anything to be splitting families. You know, you're safe whether you do and you're safe whether you don't. <laughs> as long as your heart's right before God and you add faith and you act in faith, whatever you act in has got to be from faith birthed in your heart. And, um, and there's no condemnation for those who do or no condemnation for those who don't. Some people, it's a stumbling block, you know. They, they, they preach it like this is what God says. Well, I want to tell you, God can speak differently to every one of you on the same issue, <laughs> depending on your heart, <laughs> depending on your belief system. Because if you do it without believing, it's useless. It's not worth anything. <laughs> If you do it and it's not birthed out of faith, you're not going to see the result or the benefit of any of it. So I just want to share with you, be prayerful in, in regard to the questions that we're hearing in the world at the moment. Some people can't work without these things and, um, and so they're getting forced into that. That's what I'm against. I'm against the forcing of people to do something against their will. Amen. Because the one thing that Jesus won for us was freedom. Freedom to choose. It's the first gift he gave mankind. You choose. He doesn't force you to love him. <laughs> it's a matter of the heart. Amen. And you should use, apply that to everything in your life. Issues of the heart. Guard your heart. It's a wellspring of life. That's what the word of God says. Having said that, um, we've just had some sheep to the block this week. 
We now have, how many sheep have we got? 32? <laughs> 32 and a half is half. <laughs> we just checked one giving birth. <laughs> um, we end up getting some sheep with lambs at foot and we got a good deal. We end up, we've been preparing the block for, for you know, planting things, putting sheep in. When things get really tough, you're going to be able to come down here and get a leg of lamb. <laughs> <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> Amen. When there's a need. So, do you know? Oh, no, no, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> do you know what a uh, priest is? Not a Catholic priest, not an Anglican priest, but a priest in God's eyes. Do you know what a priest is? A butcher. David was a priest and a king. And when he retrieved the Ark of the Covenant, he ended up sacrificing from Nacon's floor all the way to Jerusalem where he was going to place the Ark of the Covenant. But he couldn't do it without sacrifice. He had to do it God's way. There was a way of doing this. And they slayed a bullock every 10 paces. And they say the distance between Nacon's floor and Jerusalem is approximately 11 kilometres. One of the bloodiest paths <laughs> that day. For every 10 kilometres, every uh, 10 paces, they were slaying a bullock. They sacrificed, blood sacrifice. So the, the high priest, David was representative of the high priest at the time, he had musos who were priests. They were all butchers primarily because they had to learn how to sacrifice these things. Do you realise that? Yeah, they didn't know that. <laughs> it was a sacrifice that was necessary. You know, we're the same. When we come into the presence of God, there's a way of coming into that presence. The ark had been taken by the Philistines and it was being returned to Jerusalem. I'm not going to preach on this, but I just want to, once you get some background, they, um, they had to slay animals. That was the Old Testament way of sacrificing and coming into the presence of God. And the Ark of the Covenant was brought back, but they tried to bring it back on a man-made contraption, a car, with two bellowing cows who had been cut off from their babies. And they wanted their babies, but they were driven by the Spirit of God to keep them moving and bring that Ark of the Covenant, which is this, it represented the presence of God, the tabernacle where they could meet with God. And so this was coming back to the, to the Jews. And they put it on this cart, and Yuza, you all know the story of Yuza, it went over a bump, had that threshing floor, Nacon's threshing floor, and the cart nearly came, the, the ark nearly came off the cart, and Yuza was one of the priests that was bringing it back. He put his hand up to stop it falling off the cart, and he was struck dead instantly. Scared the living daylights out of you, wouldn't it? If you were a priest. <laughs> And David was ticked off. David got fearful now because this cart was coming back to him, to the temple in Jerusalem. He got fearful that someone could get struck dead for touching the cart, the, the ark. And that's because God had certain ways of doing things. User was used to being around the Ark of the Covenant and he became blasé. He became user friendly. <laughs> and he shouldn't have. <laughs> he shouldn't have touched the ark. There was a set way of doing things. God wanted that ark to be set apart. That ark was set apart. It had to be touched by uh, one priest, but in a certain manner. 
And David then got frightened of the presence of God in the ark. And what did he do? He left it at that threshing floor. There's a guy called, called Obed-Edom, was a muso. He was also a priest. And he left it at that bend in the road, at the threshing floor. And Obed-Edom prospered because for three months he had the presence of God in his house. <laughs> David had gone to Jerusalem. He was frightened. He's, he was ticked off. He was angry. <laughs> he was angry with God for having struck that, that user down. And he couldn't work it out. Why? Why did he strike a, a priest down? And so he started to study the scriptures and he found that God didn't want his presence carried on a man-made contraption. He wanted his presence to be carried by men on poles, on their shoulders, which was figurative of what we were going to become, his presence in us. We carry the presence of God today. Every one of us who are born again, spirit-filled, water-walking people carry the presence of God, and God designed it this way. He wanted us to carry the presence of God by his Holy Spirit living in us. Amen? So he was ticked when it was done any other way. He was not happy. And David studied this up, and he, he also got ticked that Obed-Edom was prospering so much because he had the presence of God in his house. So he wanted the ark back. He wanted the presence of God back because he wanted to prosper. When you've got God's presence on you, you will prosper. You will prosper incredibly. I wasn't going to preach this, but you're getting it anyway. <laughs> he went back to the threshing floor and he'd worked out that he had to get some priests to be able to carry this thing and that was God's method of transporting the presence the presence of God. He also understood he had to sacrifice and he sacrificed every 10 feet according to the way God wanted that ark to be brought in. So I want to tell you, if you want to be a priest, you better look at the job description, you're going to become a butcher. <laughs> no, not really. He doesn't require blood sacrifices anymore. Jesus paid the blood sacrifice. Okay? Jesus paid the blood sacrifice. He sent his lamb to pay the price. The only sacrifice he requires from us is the fruit of our lips giving thanks. That's it. Hebrews 13, 15. Just the fruit of our lips giving thanks releases the power of God, the presence of God into your life. You realise that? That's the sacrifice that he expects today. Praise God. What was that song we were going to sing? Praise God. Your God is more than enough in these times. Can we sing that? Got it. He's your God too, you know. Uh, <laughs> he's my God and he's your God. Do you know, there's a way of handling God's word and principles and living with the Lord that we need to adhere to, and it's all in this word. We can't serve him to the fullness of what we want without getting to know what it is that he wants. You know, we need to know what he wants. You need to hear his voice. You need to be people who can walk and talk with him. And that's where we're heading as a people. At this time, he is clarifying his people's thinking. He's causing them, uh, yesterday I was talking to a man and all this man could say was, it's in his word, it's in his word. I said, mate, you're missing the whole point. The word points you to a relationship with Jesus. The word is a roadmap. <laughs> the word is the power of God. It's the word that's come out of God's mouth that he will back 100%. But you still need to hear what to do. You can use one word for the wrong purpose and you will never see the power of God. You can choose the wrong word because it's your choice and you haven't heard <laughs> and you won't see the result. 
Amen? You need to hear what God is saying to you because every answer you need is in that word. Every answer. But you also have relationship with the Holy Spirit who will bring that word to life in you. You need to get to that place of knowing the difference, the rema, which is the word of God coming to you for a situation. If we start to walk and learn to hear God, and it's a learned thing. I've got to tell you, when you come into the kingdom of God, your spirit comes alive to God. But you've still got to be trained to hear his voice because there's other voices. There's the voice of the enemy. There's your own voice, your own desires. Anybody got any of those? No, not you, Mob. I can see that. <laughs> but you need to know the difference. You've got to sharpen your hearing. You've got to sharpen your relationship. Your relationship. You usually got really good with his relationship, but so good that he become blasé. Amen. We need, hey? Because he'll train you. He will train you. If you come to him and ask him, if you trust him, you know, too many people trust themselves, their own thinking, their own, and, and, and there are ways of discerning the voice of God. You know, when I first started wanting to hear the voice of God, I, I was born again. The very next morning I was hearing his voice. And I knew the difference because I had terrible thoughts. <laughs> My thoughts weren't his. My thoughts were totally different. I used to do things totally differently. But God started to show me. He started to teach me through his word. And his spirit would speak to me. First thing he told me to do was to get married. Well, you can all guess why. <laughs> we were living together, Denise and I. Is that right, Denise? Praise God. And we were happy. <laughs> yep. Yes, exactly. You know, I'll tell you how it comes. It comes like a thought out of left field, something you're not thinking about at all but it cuts into a problem that you're having trouble with or, or a theme that you're going through at the time, and he'll just cut through that. And he'll cut through your, nat nat your natural, normal thinking because you won't, you're not expecting it, but it's the answer that you've been asking about. If you ask, he'll speak to you. If you ask, he will get that word to you. It may not be the instant you want it. <laughs> it might take a week. It might take an hour. It might be instant. You know, he just... Depends on how you're open to him. If you've set your heart and you're fully believing him, you'll hear God. And you'll know it's him. And it'll be confirmed in his word. His word will always confirm what he's saying. I, I, some people just memorize that word like parrots, but they don't believe it. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to them. It's just a, re a recited word. And some people... In Bible colleges, I'll teach you, meditate on the Word of God. But meditate on it so you believe it. <laughs> and don't, don't apply then the Word of God that suits your situation. You can't manipulate the Word of God. You wait on God until he tells you what it is. That's a good one. Though. All right? Until he tells you what it is, that Word that's, that's for you. Hearing God is imperative today for every believer. Every believer. Hearing God is what you should be majoring in. When you start walking with God in obedience to what you hear, he starts to write your life story. <laughs> Do you realise that? He calls it a ready pen, a theme that goes through your life. I shared about that, how he... He got me back to my estranged daughter, who I had a daughter from the marriage, 34 years before I was able to see her. And 34 years down the track, he ambushed me in Sydney. And today I've got a great relationship with his daughter. But it, it was through something that he started 34 years before. He asked me, someone asked me to become a godfather a young boy. The 
the young boy was the son of my uh, sister-in-law at the time. I was married and it was her son. I became a godfather at the baptism. I didn't even know what a godfather was. I'd, I'd seen the uh, Italian films. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the godfather he wanted me to be. He wanted me to be a godfather to oversee the Christian upbringing of that young man. And when my marriage split, there was no, no way that I even kept in touch with that family. But 34 years later, that theme that had started then, he ambushed me because I ended up praying for that young man's daughter. That young man's daughter was in her mother's womb and they'd said she had a tumour in the brain. And this woman asked me, Jim got, got in touch with me, he said, Raf, he said, there's a South African woman from Zimbabwe. He said, um, she, her, her daughter is having a baby and that baby has a tumour in the brain and they're going to operate in the womb. I'm going, why? God. Medical science has come a long way, hasn't it? And uh, so I started praying. I went and saw the lady. I said, listen, God's just spoken to me. The reason this baby's got this tumour is because um, it's a Zimbabwean curse. We'll break the curse and the baby will be okay. We broke the curse. Three days later, they were going to operate on the baby. And the doctors took a scan before they went in the operation and they said, something's changed here. We're not going to touch this. We're going to... She was seven months pregnant at the time. We're not going to do anything here. We're going to see what transpires. We'll wait another week to see if there's any further change. When they did another scan, they found that the baby had totally improved, so they didn't touch the baby at all. Two months later, that baby was born perfectly normal, little black-eyed baby. Three months later, I find out that this baby is my godson's daughter. You getting this? <laughs> my godson's daughter. Somehow he's intersected our lives. This theme, oh, my God, it's touching me. I've got to say, <laughs> this theme that's going through our lives Every one of our lives. Why? Because we trust him, because we do it his way. His way is by giving your life to him and trusting him fully. There's healing on your life. Don't worry what the doctors say to you, okay? For too long you've worried what the doctors have said and the symptoms, says the Lord. But my word, my promises to you, you will live and be a father to your children because that's been your innermost prayer. Is that right? You'll be okay. You can take that to the bank. Praise God. You know, you've got to hear God. You have to hear the Lord. Praise God. This theme is going through all your lives. Whatever he started in you, he's faithful to complete. And somewhere along the track, he's going to ambush you. Praise God. He's going to ambush you. We just bought some sheep. <laughs> Well, Jeff at the back there, he went down to get him yesterday with young Darren. Darren got onto a stock agent. Is that right? And we got these sheep at a good price. I went to pick it up. And he brings me the invoice yesterday, the contract. And where they got the sheep from was a bloke that I'd prayed for in 2008, <laughs> total stranger at the airport. We were going to do a, a meeting in Brisbane, this theme, this theme. It'll pick up your life everywhere if you're alert. If you're not alert, you'll miss it. He's got to get you the next level. He's got all these little jobs for you to do. He's got all these divine appointments for every one of you. And so this man, I'll read his name, and I remember him. I remember I was at the airport and the place was fogged in and Benny Hinn was 
doing a thing in Sydney and half of the Adelaide who's who in the charismatic zoo were going to Sydney. <laughs> That's true. That's so true. <laughs> and they were fogged in and had to wait at the airport. The airport was full of Christians that day. We were going to Brisbane, which was an inconvenience because Brisbane wasn't fogged in, but it had messed up all the flights. So there we are waiting in the airport, and uh, I think we were with Virgin, and they said, come and get a docket so you get a free cup of coffee and a cake while you're waiting. So everybody's lined up, all the Christians are all lined up to get a free cup of coffee and a cake. And there we are, and this bloke's standing in front of me, a giant of a bloke, and uh, we all started talking on the line. I said, mate, what are all these Christians doing here? Because I recognised some faces. You know, Adelaide's fairly small. And he said, oh, we're going to Benny Hinn. I said, what are you going for? He said, I, I need some healing. I said, really? I said, let me pray for you. I said, you'll be healed now. And he looked at me. He said, okay. So I prayed for him. Next thing, he's on the floor in the airport. The anointing of God's hit him and he's hit the floor and he's touched. He gets up, he's fully healed. He had an enlarged heart and he was due for an operation. We didn't know that until two, three months later. I'm preaching in some church. And he stands up and he says, excuse me, he said, can I just say something before you preach? And there I am, I recognise his face. Total stranger to us. And so he gives this testimony of how he got healed at the airport, this theme. Now we buy some sheep and guess whose sheep they are? <laughs> his. <laughs> Does this, doesn't this blow your mind? This theme goes through all your lives and it continues. It continues. It keeps coming up in your life. God's going to ambush you because before you were ever born, he destined you to be a victorious person once he came into your life. Once you can trust him, once you give your life to him and trust him for everything, this theme Will flow through your life. Can't help it. Can't help it. But I've got to tell you, it's all predicated on you hearing God. Isn't that something? It's all predicated on your relationship with the living God. Because somewhere along the track, he's going to wake you up. I, I don't know if you ever played those games, uh, Pac-Man, is that the, you know, all those uh, games kids play? And there was one where... This thing used to gobble a log <laughs> and then pick up an energy pill. And so along the path, it would pick up one of these energy pills. And the Lord spoke to me one day while I was mucking around playing with that thing. And he said, this is like your life, Raf. He said, as you go along, he said, you're going to find these things that are in place for you to do. Just like that Pac-Man hits an energy pill on the track you're taking. He said, there's something you need to do that I've already pre-prepared for you. I said, where's that in the Bible? You, you, don't you ask God? Because he wants to show you things. He said, Raph, he said, what do you think happened when in John 9, he said, the man who was blind and the disciples asked me, what caused this? Was his parents in sin or was he in sin? He said, no, no. He said, this man is here to reveal the glory of God. To reveal the glory of the living God. And so he went up to him, he got some mud, stuck it in his eyes, then told him to go wash at the pool of Siloam. And the man's sight was restored. I want to tell you, that was a creative miracle he did. Jesus was with the Father when he was making every one of us. Do you realise that? In the book of Psalms it says he was there watching the creation of God. He was there. And when that man came off the line, he was sent to earth as an unfinished creation. How were we made? Mud. Earth. He blew on us. How did he fix him and finish the creation here on earth? Mud. Told him to go and wash. 
and the eyes were formed. Can you believe that? Can you? That's, that's the, the creation miracle. And we can walk in these things. See, he's got a theme going through your life and somewhere along the track you're going to meet up with that plan that the Father's already got and do what the Father's asked you to do if you're listening. I, I can remember we were sharing, I don't know who I was sharing with this week, but we are sharing, we did some meetings at Traugan, um, oh, 2008 was it, Bricky? I can't remember, 2000 and we saw people come out of strokes. We saw God do some incredible miracles. But one of the most amazing miracles was a girl in the crowd who was blind in one eye. And all she had was the white of her eye and no pupil. The white of her eye without a pupil. And when she came up, we broke a curse off her life as God told us to. He told us what to break. Next thing, a line appears right down the middle of the white flesh in her eye. Just like someone had got a black biro, a very fine tip, and just drew a line through there. She still couldn't see, but this line appeared. We did two more meetings. That line opened up like a rosebud, formed a full pupil in her eye, and she could see. Creative miracle. A creative miracle. God's still in the throes. Of, were you there with us, Phil, that, that one, I think? Who, who was that? Mike Gillies, that's right. Just this thing just was formed in the twinkling of a, an eye. He intersected our lives and met up with us at that point as a divine appointment. Just as Jesus had a divine appointment with a man in Luke 9 to bring glory to the Father. And that's why these things are in place. We've got to be attentive to what God's put on our lives and act upon that. See, most people aren't aware that there's a call on them. I think we're saved. I can hang out now until my day comes and I'm straight up. We've got a job to do here. We have a job to do, every one of us. And if you're listening, you're listening He's going to give you divine appointments that are going to reveal the glory of God. You know, it makes it so easy when you share Christ. Do you know that? If you can move in the manifestation of the glory of God, which are the miracles, the signs and the wonders, the words of knowledge, the acts of faith. Amen? The acts of faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What's this young man's name? Jeff. Jeff. Jeff, give me a hand, will you? You've been in hospital and how, you've just come out, have you? Yeah. Praise God. Okay. Healing's flowing into your life today. You're going to be strengthened from one increment of glory to the next. You thought you were deteriorating, but God says, no, I'm going to strengthen you. Your latter days are going to be stronger than the first one, says the Lord. See, you're an evangelist. You share God. Amen. Amen. You're going to do a lot more of it and the strength's coming into your body in Jesus' name. Amen. God. God. Yeah, Peter, come here. Thank you, Lord. Actually, no, I'm going to pray for the rash that you've got. Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Father, we break the power of the infirmity on this young man's life in Jesus' name. We come against it by the blood of Jesus Christ and command the rash to leave his body in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. You know, we've got to be attentive to the voice of God and act on what he's telling you. We demonstrate this in our meetings if we can, but we demonstrate it outside. This gifting has been given to you for outside. This gift of the Holy Spirit has been given to you so the world can be reached and the glory of God can be shown through you. Every one of you has this call on your life. Every one of us. Do you realise that? Yeah. The only thing is we need to get to that place of searching out what the plan is for you. I was talking to, to Mike today. He was telling me about a guy, who a sheep, a sheep man, a 
sheep man, what was his name? Brian? Was it Brian? Yeah. This, this Brian guy, we did a full gospel businessman's meeting once um, at uh, Barry Young's place. Now, see, now, I didn't know these guys. They got in touch with us, said, would you come and do a meeting at Blackwood? And um, we were busy doing a Christian radio show that we had up here, a local show. And about midnight I got home that night, that Sunday night, and the Holy Spirit said, tomorrow you're going to be preaching to the full gospel people. And uh, he said, spend some time with me. I said, oh, okay. It was late, I wanted to go to bed. Was, I got home after midnight and I started spending some time with the Lord and about three minutes later I'm <laughs> out like a light. So I went to bed. I thought, this is hopeless. I went to bed and about an hour later, the Holy Spirit wakes me up. He says, get up, Raph. And I said, Lord, I'm tired. Can't we talk in the morning? And he said this to me. And I'll tell you, if ever you hear this, you're going to be charged with the power of God. He said this to me. He said, don't you want to know what we're doing tomorrow? <laughs> Don't you want to know what we're doing tomorrow? Do you know what that does to you? <laughs> I leapt out of bed. <laughs> Instantly not tired. <laughs> Instantly charged up. I wanted to know what he had planned for us because we're doing it together. You always do it together with him. It's him that's doing the work. You're just the arms and the legs. You're just taking them there. <laughs> Amen? You're carrying the presence of God and the glory of God, and that glory of God is what he wants to release. I wanted to speak on the anointing this morning. But obviously we've got to speak about the anointing, the glory, the release of the anointing and the glory. Because you're carrying that, every one of you. But unless you understand what timing in your life you're at, we're on this incredible link that he's got you on, this theme for your life, this plan that he's already pre-planned for you. If you don't know where you are, you're not going to hear to do what he's asking you to do. You're going to be too concerned with the things of this world, too concerned with the worries of this world to be listening. And you might just miss that divine appointment. And God wants you to be attentive to that. That's why you set your lives for the Lord. You listen to him, you talk to him on a daily basis. He wants you ready for this miracle he's got in front of you. And I want to tell you, a miracle is easy to perform if you're in time and, and you intersect that destiny that he's got for you. If you're there right on time, right on time, and you're here, you're going to start moving in the miraculous. And that's what he's trying to release right now into his church. Is anybody being helped here today? Oh, yes. Amen. Because I want to tell you, some of you are going to get so hungry to spend time with him, you're going to start to see miracles break out in your life. Miracles break out. Praise God. Mate. Who would have thought buying sheep would be a divine appointment? Amen? The theme, once again. You wouldn't believe that man's mum started coming, the guy who owned the sheep, his mum started coming to our meetings because of what happened at the airport. And I ended up doing her funeral. She was 94 years old. Her name was Ruby. Praise God. Beautiful woman of God she was. She brought up her boy as a man of God. Divine intervention, themes that God's got for you. Every one of you, everyone in this room has these themes from the youngest to the oldest in this room. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I get excited. I get excited when we come to these meetings. Sometimes you never know what's going to happen. That, that man, Brian, that day when the full gospel guys called us, God spoke to me 
in my prayer chair. I sat down. I couldn't wait to get out there when he said, don't you want to know what we're doing? I jumped in that chair and I said, well, what are we doing tomorrow? And he said, close your eyes and then tell me what you see. So I closed my eyes and I had a man's face appear. I never met him before, never, never seen that face before. And all I heard him say was, that's Brian. <laughs> then another face appeared. He said, that one's Barry. And he told me their problems. He said, you're going to pray for these men, they're going to get healed. <laughs> Brian had a back problem. Probably crutch and sheep. <laughs> He has a back problem. He said, Barry's got a shoulder problem. There were two others. I can't remember their names now, but they were crystal clear that day. Two more faces. He said, you'll meet them at the meeting you're doing tonight. He said, and that's their problem. Just call them out. He said, I'll heal them on the spot. Divine appointments. Divine appointments. Because we spent time with him. That's a sacrifice sometimes. The greatest sacrifice is wanting to be with him. It's not a sacrifice at all. It's the most glorious place to be. It's the most wondrous place to be. But I've got to tell you, if you develop it, if you develop this relationship, you're going to be ready to walk in what he's asking you to do. You're going to be attentive to when that, when that um, miracle is in place, that intersection of that man's life with your life and the Spirit of God has orchestrated this whole thing. And I've got to tell you, when that happens, miracles are just going to manifest. They're just going to manifest. And you're going to be known as a manifestor of miracles. Do you know that? You're going to be known as a manifestor of miracles. Praise God. And healing. Well, that man, sure enough, that day we went there and guess what happened? We're having dinner and I'm calling Barry Brian and Brian Barry because I'm a bunhead. <laughs> and Denise said, no, she, we were introduced to them, that's Brian, that's Barry, <laughs> while we're having tea. And I could hardly wait and God says, tell them during the meeting because other people's faith will be lifted. You're going to bring glory to me. So as soon as I told them in the meeting, I called them out and said, yeah, God wants to heal your back. He wants to heal your arm. One of them, Brian, was rejoicing. Barry had this uh, face which was dead straight, didn't give anything away. <laughs> I left that meeting not knowing whether he'd been healed or touched or anything. Three days later, he phoned me. He said, Raph, he said, um, I want to thank you for being obedient. He, I said, what's that thing with your arm? He, I said, what, what happened? He said, 20 years ago, he said, my arm started shrinking, withering. He said, surgically, they froze it to stop it going any further. He said, all my muscle tone had been wasted away. He said, my arm returned perfectly normal. He said, I wanted to go and test it out. <laughs> So he went to his farm at Dark Peak, I think, somewhere on the, on the, on the coast, or Yolanda, no, Yolanda, Lock, Lock, that's where it was. And he went and worked on his farm that his boys had taken over to test his arm, to see if it had really been healed. And he phoned me three days later. These divine appointments have been given to us. They're in place. They're in place. And you have them in front of you. Every one of you have those very same things in front of you. When you spend time with the Lord, ask him. In fact, we're going to pray even now before we close up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. You can use anything, Lord. 
You can use me. Well, you can use anything, Lord. You can use me. There's the anointing coming in. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Mel, I've got a word for you from the Lord. You know, you know the Lord, you know about God, but he wants you to make him your saviour from this day on, to be led by him. When he takes you over to Tassie, once you've given your heart to him fully, God says you'll see the miraculous where he takes you and you will start to hear his voice very clearly and you'll see the miracles over in Tassie. You're a bold girl, he says, and you will do things that if he asked other people they wouldn't react. He says, but you will be one who will react immediately and see the fruit of the miracles. Do you want that? Just repeat after me. Say this, Lord Jesus, take over my life fully. Forgive me for everything I've done wrong. And I forgive everyone who's hurt me. I release them. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and write my name in your book of life. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. You're going to sleep different. God says you're actually going to sleep well. I don't know what is, what, what's done that, but there's been times when you can't sleep. Tonight you're going to have a good night's sleep and God will start speaking to you. Okay? If you listen, when you're in Tassie, he's going to wrought miracles through you if you're obedient to listening to him. You can take that to the bank and then you better get in touch with us and let us know about those stories, okay? <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. A theme, a theme, an intersection. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Aren't you glad you came to this meeting, Mel? <laughs> you glad you came? Yeah? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. God says it's time for you time. It's time. God says it's time. He's going to give you stuff to do. He's going to intersect people's lives through you. This week's a red letter week for you, says the Lord. <laughs> this week, you'll start to see. So you share God wherever you go quietly, but now you're going to become a bold man. God wants you bold. <laughs> Speak the word of God and expect. Expect it. You know, you won't see anything unless you expect it. You won't see anything in God unless you expect it. Just believe. You've got to add faith. When God speaks to you, it, it, it's, it's mixed with faith in your heart. You hear the word of God, you mix it with faith, and the miraculous is released. Anybody want that? There's two people there. Anybody else want that? Three, four. I've got to tell you, this is what we're destined for. Every one of us, we're destined for this. We've got to become radical Christians. No good just warming the pews on a Sunday and thinking, no, I've done my bit for the week. God wants you to become radical. You've got something that people need. Eternal life. That's what you're carrying. Yeah. You know, Releasing the glory of God is your job here on earth now. It's your job here on earth. You've got to be releases of the glory. Chester's not here today, so I can, I can 
I'll tell you something that won't make him a big head, but <laughs> Chester releases the glory of God wherever he goes. We'd go and work Wednesdays down in the healing rooms down in, in Adelaide. He'd go into Marion and he would leave a trail of glory right through Marion Shopping Centre that everybody he'd talk to, would, he'd drag them back to the meetings. <laughs> he'd get them saved. He would release what was inside of him. Wouldn't he? You know, I'd lost track of how many people he would bring into those meetings. Bold. Boldness. I want to pray for boldness for everyone in this house. Can we do that? Do you want boldness? You're not going to be chicken hearted, are you? Once we prayed this. <laughs> do you want do you want boldness? Put your hands up if you want boldness. Because I'll tell you now, he's going to release it. If we're asking for it, two or more. You can ask for anything as it's being done here on earth and it's yours. Put your hands up. You're all under arrest, a whole lot of you. You all need it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Are you ready? Father, I pray right now for a gift of boldness to come on your people. <laughs> oh, there it is right now. It's coming already. A gift of boldness. It's already hitting down the back there. Sure, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Father. A gift of boldness to come upon you. Oh, thank you, Lord. It's coming down like a blanket on, on, on this whole meeting at the moment. A gift of boldness. You're going to find yourself being able to speak without fear. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's someone on Zoom right now. I was praying this morning and the Holy Spirit gave me a name. I, I don't want to speak it out, but this is for you. God says you're full of fear and you've got to stop. And the reason you're full of fear is this. You had a choice and you made a carnal choice and then you can't forgive yourself for it. And God says stop because that's what's making you ill. Stop. That carnal choice, he's already paid for on the cross. You are free because of repentance, says the Lord. Now move, move forward from that. You know who, who I'm talking to? I was praying this morning. I was praying this morning and he gave me a sign as I was driving in the drive here today to speak this into the Zoom you made a carnal choice and it stopped your walk and allowed fear in and it's made you ill. Just turn right now, repent, ask the Lord for forgiveness and you're free immediately and the sickness is leaving your body as we speak. And God just put it in the sea of forgetfulness, so you better as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, I, I even can tell you the name, but I'll, next time I see you, I'll, I'll speak to you. You're free. Forget it. It's gone. Amen. God is in the business of releasing people, not condemning them. God has sent his son. His son is good news. <laughs> Amen? You're free. Don't worry about what the doctor said. The symptoms, the symptoms is what you keep putting in front of you. And whatever you look at, you become like. So you've got to stop thinking about those things. All right? You've got to start looking at what his promise says. What's his promise say? He is the Lord that heals you. Amen. He's the Lord that heals you. Father, we just thank you for today. We're going to have communion. Yeah. Have we got some communion people? Thank you, Lord. You can use anything, Lord. 
You can use me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Thanks, Lord. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Thank you, Lord. You can use anything. Have we got that? You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Anybody get anything out of today's meeting? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Amen. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Oh, yeah. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Joyce, the Lord says to you, well done. Well done, Joyce. God says, well done. I'm hearing it coming down at the moment. He says, well done. Your faith is setting you free. You'll be a sign that'll make people wonder. Amen. Well, you, what you've been through, they haven't heard yet, but I want to tell you, you've been through a horrific time and you've kept your faith strong. You know what that's done for the Lord? It's pleased him no end. And I just kept hearing that. Joyce, you're pleasing God. You're pleasing God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Oh. Praise God. If I keep pressing this button.